let me introduce our wonderful guest here, uh, Eric Calderon. Uh, my name is Adam Strickland. I'll be the moderator. And Eric Calderon, founder of the Surviving Animation YouTube channel, executive vice president of creative development at Falcons Beyond. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Some of the previous companies he's worked for include MTV Animation, Sega of America Incorporated, 20th Century Fox Film, Machinima, and Warner Brothers Animation. Before we begin the presentation, allow me to give a quick thank you to all of our lovely sponsors who've been gracious enough to support us here at Asifa South, Robert C. Williams Museum of Papermaking, Awesome Incorporated, SCAD Film, Toon Boom, Slothique Animation Production, Reillusion, Atlanta Jewish Film Festival, Trioscope, Hubtaku, Fox Render Farm, Georgia Production Partnership, Georgia Film Site, Atlanta Film Festival, and ACM SIGGRAPH. Uh, anyone who happens to be watching virtually is welcome to post their questions in the chat, and we'll try to get to them later in the presentation. For those of you who are watching in person in the room there, uh, you, we will make time to answer your questions uh, later in the presentation as well. So without further ado, I hope you enjoy the presentation and I'll hand things over to Eric. Hey everyone, how you doing? Uh, thanks for having me. Thanks for Asifa South and Asifa for letting me speak. Um, hope you guys are having a good uh, convention festival over there, learning a lot about uh, empowering yourselves as creators. Uh, I'm gonna give you a little talk about some of the things that I've done and some of the things that I know, and then we'll kind of quickly open it up to questions. So uh, I'm gonna share a screen and we're gonna start. So. All right, so please tell me if you can see that. Give me an arm wave, some kind of motion if you can see what's on the screen. Anybody? Adam, can they see what I'm seeing? I can see it. Can okay. someone please wave to let us know that you can see the screen that he's trying to share? Do you guys in the room there see a uh, picture of some fruit and some cake? All right, great, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. All right. So today, uh, my speech is actually called Let Them Eat IP, and it's about empowering creators. And it's going to be a little bit about how you as an as a new person kind of creating content for world consumption can kind of understand how this entire thing works. So, wow, that's a lot of waves. Thank you. Thank you. Great. It's some, some robot hand moves, too, which is good. There so. might be a slight delay with the streaming. Oh, I see. I understand. Okay. Um, Adam, about how long is the delay, do you think? We can do a quick test. Okay. Everyone raise your hand in one, two, three seconds. Now. <laughs> That's quite a delay. It is. 10, 11, 12, 13. That's a fifth. That's a 30 second delay. Hmm. Is that going to be okay? Well, I guess the show must <laughs> okay. go on. We can make it work. Okay. <laughs> wow. All right. So uh, we're going to keep proceeding, but there is about a 30 second delay. So we'll kind of move forward under that assumption. So, all right, let's talk about uh, today's uh, agenda. So I'm going to start and tell you a little bit about me, about what I've done, what I've kind of been around. Um, then I'm going to talk directly about you and your ideas. So when you come up with an idea, I'll help you understand how and when it's best suited for animation. Um, is your idea good for today? Uh, and then understanding an important thing that I think is often forgotten, which is the format of cartoons. Then we'll talk a little bit about what I call the long solo versus bend the knee, which is kind of going independent versus working with a major studio. Uh, go a little bit into the general idea of how the business of animation works talk about Marie Antoinette and the big studio system, and then talk about uh, lifespan, copyright, and trademark. So that's kind of the general agenda of today. All right, so let's begin with this. Uh, so I've been in the business actually for about 28 years now. Um, I've been an executive, been a showrunner, been a writer, producer, company owner, and a YouTuber and a public speaker. So I've worked in uh, the US, I've worked in Canada, I've worked in uh, Southeast Asia, I've worked in France, I've worked in Singapore. So I've seen a lot of different ways that different countries around the world um, do animation. Um, I'm very active on LinkedIn, if you wanna follow me there or follow news about uh, things that I find interesting in cartoons. Uh, and also my YouTube channel, I have not actually made a video in about seven months because I have a newborn baby. So, and I just moved to Orlando. 
So uh, they'll be coming soon, uh, but I'm going to be doing a new video about location-based entertainment and animation, uh, which is what I'm doing right now at Falcons Beyond here in Orlando. Actually, what I'm doing is helping theme parks, especially the ones that we make, uh, tell original stories, uh, create new characters uh, that can expand out to everything else besides the theme park, which is, you know, like games and comics and toys and cartoons and films and movies. Okay. All right. So now that you know a little bit about who I am and where I've been, here are some of the shows that I've actually worked on. So um, you'll see on this page, uh, some very adult properties, some kids properties, um, some action properties, some comedies. So I've been around a lot of genres. I've done a lot of different types of formats. So CG, 2D, 3D, stop motion, you know, all these different ways. I even did a, a few rotoscope jobs. Um, really, really love the craft of animation, love the uh, the making of animation, making cartoons. So it's been a, a passion for my whole life. So what you saw on those two pages is about 28 years uh, and about 11 companies. And I've put about 20, 20 animated series and films, uh, music videos and comics uh, on the air. But what you didn't see which is where a lot of the work is in doing development and working on new ideas is, you know, I, I produced probably about 70 pilots or animatics, um, about 300 actual pitches. I've, I've gone to buyers, presented live, and they said no to me to my face. Um, I've actually uh, read about 2,000 proposals, maybe about five, 6,000 pages if you add it all up. And uh, I probably have two or 300 pitches over my career that have been sent to me that I just didn't have time or was the wrong time to review or couldn't review for some kind of legal reason. And I've done over a hundred contracts, whether they be contracts, partnership deals, options, all that kind of stuff. So um, when it comes to creating new ideas, presenting new ideas and bring them to animation, that's kind of what I've spent my whole career on. And I think the single most important thing I like to impart to people when they come to me with a new idea about a cartoon is really, is the best place for this intellectual property animation, right? So I think, you know, as we go into the details of this presentation, you know, one of the things I always try to tell people is, is your idea really great for cartoons? Because there's really only a subset of ideas that work best in animation. So if you think about an intellectual property or an idea, and as that idea then gets distributed out into the world and different types of entertainment, there are a lot of forms that can take. So that can be publishing, games, comics, you know, card games, all that stuff. And, but, you know, people tend to think of linear media, especially TV series and movies, as kind of the idea. But actually, the idea is a little left of center, and TV series, movies, and linear media is kind of a subset of that intellectual property. So, you know, this takes a lot of contextual analysis. It takes a lot of hard thinking. Um, but really look at your idea. Really look at your format and think, where's the best way to express this? And, and oftentimes... For example, someone who creates these fantastical worlds and these big fantasies and the kind of creator who pitches me like a big map, like here's the world and the countries and the different types of you know races and all their different war factions and all their powers. Those ideas actually are better suited, I think, for, for games. They may not always work well in TV series or movies because there's just sometimes too much. And that kind of creator may not understand what it's like to take that world and tell us a very single story with a very limited amount of screen real estate. So um, again, so I, I always want to tell people, make sure that your idea, the best expression of it is an animation. That takes a lot of discussion, a lot of um, deep thinking, and a lot of talking with people who are good at those mediums. So if you kind of have a hint that maybe your, your animated series is great for novels, you should talk to novelists. You should actually get them to tell you, is this really right for a novel? Is there a lot of interior dialogue? Is there a lot of complicated um, plot threads? Is there is there dozens and dozens of characters? Is there all this um, kind of sprawling world that has to take the time of three, 500 pages to do? That's a novel. That's not necessarily a TV series. Okay, so let's say you get past this moment and you're like, you know what? My idea is really good for animation. I really believe it's a TV series or a film or a short. Um, is it today? And I think, you know, having something that is today is, is being kind of aware of where culture is at, of where people are at, of what they're doing. And, you know, it's an entire conversation uh, about what is uh, right for today. But here are some important things I like to tell people. I'm sure that a lot of you, you know, if, if you're kind of in the kind of Gen Z um, or younger category, you probably know this already. 
But, you know, traditionally for the past 40, 50 years, a lot of people have talked about the, um, the heroic journey, which is, you know, Joseph Campbell's like classic story structure based on mythology of like a single hero who goes out into the world, uh, goes out and ventures, you know, gets wisdom, gets a boon, fights bad guys, you know, meets their own kind of family or father and then wins the day and comes back and brings knowledge back to this community and they're so thankful for him. But, you know, that that's not today anymore. I mean, we live in a very interconnected world and a lot of what people are doing with storytelling right now is actually collective journeys and collective journeys. The single hero is a little bit spread out among a group of people or actually society itself being the hero and having them all kind of move together um, and realizing there are systematic problems and everyone kind of has the same information at the same time. So, you know, the collected journey kind of is where a lot of at least serial episodic storytelling is at right now. Um, also, you know, as we get more interconnected and we get more media savvy, metatextual awareness um, is a big talking point for people who actually um, are telling stories, especially in science fiction and fantasy, that we're aware of the tropes. You know, audiences are very are smart, even except for maybe preschool kids, you know, media awareness comes earlier than it ever has. So it's very hard to take a very classic, simple trope and try to put it out there because people are certainly aware of where you're coming from. Uh, the last thing, you know, obviously is uh, cultural authenticity. So um, for a while, um, you know, media was simply at a place where um, all the people on TV or on film or on cartoons were, were Caucasian and often men. Um, but now, you know, the, the first kind of step was, okay, let's kind of what we call Captain Planet, which is have, you know, kind of one person from every representative, um, you know, type of person out there be there. But that also is kind of out right now, because again, part of the metatextual awareness is that we know that that's coming. So we, we smell that it's inauthentic. Um, I think where things are at now, and this is my personal opinion, is that, you know, the story and the, um, and the nationality of the characters and, and their personality should match together. So like a Viking story could all be Caucasian man because it's really about Vikings, you know? And a show like Squid Game can be all Korean because it's based in Korea. Um, but, you know, America Chavez uh, in the Marvel universe is Latin America and she's LGBTQ. So I think, you know, as long as those things are authentic to each other, then you're really in, uh, I think, where things want to be. And again, your idea, once you know it's really for animation, should, should be culturally authentic. Okay, so... Let's say you pass those two, three things, and now you're looking at your idea. Uh, you want it to be a cartoon. Um, I think one of the most understudied parts of especially kind of professional, big budget, um, studio driven or studio financed animation is the format. So format, let's talk specifically about TV. Um, this might be shocking to you, but there are basically five types of television. Um, there's a police or that in, term, in the scripted world, there's police, hospital, legal, occupational family and flyer. So if you look at the format of television, um, almost everything falls in those categories that's scripted. Now flyer is the only one that needs some explanation. What that means is you need to have your plot kind of take off and people have to understand it before they can kind of get what your series is about. With all the other formats, you kind of just can turn on, you know, your streaming device and boom, right away, you know what kind of thing it is. If you see cops in the street, it's a police show. Right. If you see a person being carried in a gurney and doctors are taking care of, you know, it's about hospital. Right. If you see people carrying around legal books and going to courtroom, it's a legal show. And if you see anyone doing their job, which also means superheroes, you know, it's an occupational. Right. And family is the kind of show where you just watch and you're like, it's the classic living room. And there's mom and dad on the couch and someone comes home from school and says, oh, I had a rough day at school. You know, you're in a family show and you know, you're going to be surrounded in that environment and focused on that family for the entire um, show. So a lot of times I'll talk with people in TV animation and I'll say like, hey, what's your format? And they'll kind of stutter and say it's about this and about that and about this. I'm like, no, you got to be very quick. Is this police, hospital, legal, occupational, family, or flyer? And if it is flyer, you better have a very quick explanation of how people are going to get in, understand your show, and want to watch it. Because, you know, that's one of the biggest struggles. You know, even something like Breaking Bad, which is an incredible uh, ultimately, it's kind of an occupational because his job is a, is a guy who makes meth. But, um, you know, you need that first pilot episode to understand that he was a high school teacher, that his wife is sick, that he finds a unique way for meeting this guy that has a possibility for him to make enough money to save his wife. But he's got to do the terrible thing, which is sell drugs. You know, it's like or make and sell drugs. So, like, you know, that's a flyer. But that's such an efficient, perfectly written flyer 
uh, and those are a few and far between, okay? So now that you have your format down, um, I think it's important for you to understand as, as students, as young creators, that whether they say it out loud or not, you know, a lot of the big buyers, a lot of the big agents are going to kind of ask you in their own way, these four questions, you know, one, they're going to say, uh, take me to a new place or take me to a place I haven't been before. or haven't been in a long time. So a lot of times buyers will be like, oh, you've got an animated series about space. You know what? We have 15 series in space right now. Just not a good time for space. Right. Or, um, hey, I want to do a show in uh, modern day New York. And they're like, oh my gosh, we have so much stuff in modern day New York. It's the last thing we need right now. So one of the big challenges, again, once you get past, once you get past format is, is this a place I haven't been before? I haven't been in a long time, right? After that, it's very systematic. So people want to know in terms of the, um, the depth and complexity of your soap opera side of your show, do you have a main character in seven to 10 supporting mains or supporting characters? So when you talk about that structure, the main character just has to have a simple thing, right? Now that's a hard thing sometimes to express. I know it as a buyer when I hear it, when I feel it, but when you're trying to explain a character that you're going to follow through an epic journey or through a TV series, if they don't have a simple thing that you can attach really quickly, you're probably not going to grab an audience, right? So let's go back to Breaking Bad. You know, the great thing about that main character is he is a school teacher on one side and, you know, entering the world of, of, of complex uh, meth dealership on their side. Right away, that's his thing, right? So once you have your character's thing, all your major and minor characters have to do one of two things, oppose or support that thing, right? It's a very simple formula. Um, so... Um, I'll just make up something from scratch. So uh, here's a new place you haven't been in a long time. Um, uh, 1400s uh, firemen in, you know, uh, in, in the Wild West. Okay. So, um, hey, we haven't been there a long time. Cool. Let's make it in, in um, you know, the West Coast. That's cool. Um, so my main character, I'm going to say is, uh, you know, half Native American and half Caucasian. So um, she is trying to inherit the fireman business from her father, who was kind of a classic Western, you know, uh, um, pioneer. But uh, maybe that woman's mother is Native American and doesn't believe in that pioneering way. So right there, we know her thing. Is she going to uh, continue being a fire person for this, uh, you know, small town or not? So then who are the minor characters I would do? I would have all these characters that'd be like, you should be a fire person. You should not be a fire person. I'm your best buddy. Why don't you leave? I'm your worst enemy. If you fail, I'll be happy. But they all should align to that central character's point of view. Okay. Now, the final thing underneath that formula, and you do all the homework, you do all that great stuff, and you figure this all out, those powers are going to go, well, who are you? And if you can't answer with a sincerity and an expertise and an authenticity, you're just kind of writing something you know nothing about, you know? So, you know, when it goes to you being a creator, when it goes to you presenting, you've got to present a world and a point of view and an idea that you know 5 million percent so well and that no one else could do as expertly and as specifically as you can. I hope that makes a lot of sense. I hope that makes some sense. Okay, so we got past this. This is, this is one of the chunkiest parts. This is the hardest part. But I just want to fly you through once you're through that you should understand that format, even for cartoons, also relates directly with audience. So you have your, your format, your ideas, your structure. And right underneath that is they're going to be, well, who's it for? And the who's it for, especially for animation, is very specific. So here's just a list of some of the target categories that I have to deal with as a buyer and a seller. You know, preschool, two to five, divided educational and social emotional. Bridge, which is the area between preschool and kids. Again, broken into educational, social, emotional, soft comedy, action collectible boys, action collectible girls. And to keep the laundry list going, kids 6 to 11, boys 6 to 11, comedy boys, action adventure, girls action adventure, kids, blah, blah. So you see like all these different areas are very specific audiences. And when it comes to animation, especially if it's under adult, you have to actually be very aware of the cognitive abilities of a two-year-old versus a five-year-old versus a six-year-old versus a nine-year-old. Um, and then when it starts to go 14 above, it starts to all kind of, you know, work for the same level. But, you know, a six-year-old boy doesn't understand irony. And, uh, you know, a four-year-old girl doesn't understand the complexities of what the job market is like, you know. And a two-year-old has no film knowledge. So they actually can't understand things like cuts because to them, 
it's just a blink of an eye. And if if I'm a character and I'm holding a banana, and then suddenly you cut to the banana being big, a, a two year old might think, oh my god, why is there a giant banana? They wouldn't understand that you're doing a film cut close up. You know. Anyway, that's the big section. That's my big discussion on on format and audience stuff. So. Uh, you know, before we go a little further, I want to talk about basically as young creators, um, you guys are living in an incredible time. I mean, I started my career in the mid nineties and we didn't have direct access to audiences like you do now. I mean, whether it's webtoons or YouTube or, you know, self-publishing, uh, you know, novels and all the stuff, you, you know, Twitch and streaming, you know, you can just go straight to audiences. You're in a really, really lucky place. Um, but I think, you know, the, the old mindset and a lot of the current mindset is still, well, can I sell my big project to some big studio who's going to pay for the whole thing? So, you know, this discussion comes up a lot. You know, do I go direct to consumer or do I go to a big company? And I like to divide it into what I call the long solo versus bend the knee. So in the long solo format, um, you're going it alone. Uh, you know, I, my personal YouTube channel, I went it alone. I didn't talk to anyone about it. I didn't get permission from anyone. I talked about what I know, even though it's not physically the creation of animation, it's the business of animation. So the slice that I thought I would kind of carve out for myself is education, YouTube, cartoons, and that became my formula. Um, you know, it, it takes a lot of time. You know, um, my little YouTube platform didn't start earning me back money until basically the end of year two. And I'm something like the beginning of year four right now. Um, I actually don't make that much money on it anymore because I'm now full time. But when I was independent, it was close to a third of my income um, because I would post videos. I would then get direct consultations. I would get script deals. I'd get producing deals. And I built my own direct platform to the specific audience of people interested in the business of animation, whether they be amateur or professional. And, uh, you know, I could carve my own way. I made my own destiny and it, it was great and I loved it. Um, on the other side, you know, I have worked with big streamers. I have worked with big publishers, media and game companies. The great thing about them, if they love your idea, they finance the entire thing. They take care of all the distribution. They take care of all the marketing. They also own it hundred um, percent. You get paid very well for a certain amount of time to get the project made. And I think the safe assumption would be to assume that you're going to see nothing after that. Now, occasionally you will see royalties. You will see a property that sells well in a, some kind of different platform and earns money back. Or if your property managed to go through traditional syndication, which is um, uh, country by country television stations, which still exists. I mean, a lot of people think only about, you know, um, the Netflix and the Disney Pluses and the Paramount Pluses of the world. But but in truth, there's still a ton, a ton of programming that goes through traditional um, distribution, territory by territory. And every time they go through another window, someone gets paid. And when all the accounting's done, maybe you'll get a check. So, you know, there's two ways of thinking. Uh, I would say that, you know, in 2022, it's important, I think, to try both, but assume that, you know, working with the larger studios, especially on your own shows, a very, very small probability, but working on other people's shows, working on other people's projects as a staff member, as a person who works in the animation pit or, you know, works in production, very, very likely there's a huge demand for, for talent right now. So you're in a good place to kind of, to kind of do a little bit of both. Okay. So You've gotten through all this. You've got your awesome idea. It's definitely made for animation. You've got the format right. You've got the um, audience correct. You have a big buyer. Um, why are we making these cartoons? So it may be fun. It may be cool. Um, there is some ad revenue. There's, uh, you know, people buy the show for the budget plus a margin. But what really it is meant for in kind of the large way that often it gets forgotten is it's really intellectual property expansion exposure creation so you know licensing and animation have always had this dirty relationship and when it works together it's seamless and no one notices it and it's fun um you know pokemon the animation is a really fun cartoon it's actually pretty cool it is a million percent an advertisement for the card games and for the video games and for the intellectual property right dragon ball is an awesome awesome show it's an awesome manga. It's an awesome property. It's an awesome game. 70% of all revenue earned from toy animation in Japan is through Chinese skin mobile game licensing. So to them, Dragon Ball is a really annoying cost. Like, why do we have to keep paying for this every year? But if you don't keep that epic alive, if you don't keep that story current, if people aren't excited about those characters, 
they won't then go and buy the products and services and licensing that actually is the money maker of the thing. So I always remind people, making cartoons is awesome. I love it. I've spent my whole career. I'll keep doing it. Um, you can kind of go lily pad to lily pad and make shows and work on TV series. That's awesome. That can probably last you a lifetime. Um, but you know, the real wealth, the real um, power, the real um, potential of an animated property is in its perfectly married licensed relationship with a partner, right? And remember, if we go back a slide, if you're going it solo and you start to own a percentage of those, uh, those licensing divisions, then you can make real money and not do anything because out there someone's buying your stuff and you're not doing anything to make it. So uh, passive income. All right, so really quickly, I just want to say a little thing about Mary Antoinette. So uh, Mary Antoinette was famous for a phrase. Uh, I'm not going to pronounce it because my French is terrible. But what it basically means is let them eat bread. Um, so the phrase was kind of famous because it was a rich person kind of unaware of how difficult it was for those struggling and said, oh, they don't have uh, food. Well, then let them eat cake. And cake is actually very expensive uh, to make. So um, I think when you talk to people in those buying communities, you know, whether it's the Netflix and HBO Max and Prime videos, they're all saying, hey, pitch us your original show. You know, we'll, uh, we'll pay for it. You'll do really great, whatever. Um, the truth is that they're going to make the most money on it. They're going to be the ones to really win on it. Um, and all that power of your original idea, all that potential of that fully articulated specific vision that only you can create, uh, that will be fully owned by them. Um, that's good and that's bad. But just remember, you're talking to royalty and you don't always want to be talking with royalty when you yourself could be uh, the owner of the IP. So it's just kind of a constant conversation you want to have uh, in your head, do I want to get involved with those people? Do I want those shows? Yes. Uh, is this maybe better for me to do on my own and really burn away for years and, and, and build a true franchise? Because isn't it better to be George R. R. Martin, right? Who created Game of Thrones, who still owns the, the underlying copyright and then license it to HBO Max to make uh, Game of Thrones, the TV series. Uh, or imagine that guy just pitching the show, directing them and them owning it before he had written the novels, you know? So anyway, just something for you to think about. Um, there's no answer to that. It's just an ongoing conversation. Okay, last thing. Uh, although you may have a, created an original idea, uh, uh, although you may have done it on your own and it's great, um, copyright does not last, last forever. Just thing I uh, want you to know on the legal side that copyright actually, uh, the moment of copyright uh, begins of when you create it into a fixed format. So if I tell you this, this class, um, hey, I have an idea for a robot that came from the future and goes back in time and um, kills the, uh, the guy who starts a revolution. That may sound like Terminator, but that's just an idea and, and no one owns that, right? Now, if I go uh, page one, uh, you know, large man uh, appears on a, a halo of energy in the ground and he stands up and he scans the room. Um, this is the Terminator. That is a scene and that scene is then copyright because it's a fixed format. So that's the difference between an idea and a fixed format creation that is copyrightable. Now, once I've done that, um, I have an idea. I put it into a fixed format that lasts for 70 years. After that, it goes into public domain. Um, that's the new rule since 1978. So I don't know. You may have heard recently that uh, Winnie the Pooh is now public domain. So um, for years and years and years, it was owned by, I think, Disney. And then when a, the copyright finally went into public domain, you get crazy things like uh, Winnie the Pooh live action horror movie because anyone can make that um, and no one can stop that, right? Now, the difference between copyright and trademark is trademark is when you take an idea and you assign it a specific category in a specific country, you want to trademark that item. So let's go back to the Terminator idea. If I own Terminator and I made a Terminator clock uh, in America, I would, I, would, uh, I would register for a trademark to make a clock based on Terminator in North America. And I basically have two to three years to either make it or they pull the trademark from me, you know? So if someone else decides they wanna make a Terminator clock in America during that two years, I can sue for trademark violation. But if someone made a clock in China and I did not register alarm clock, Terminator, China this year, I can't do anything about it. So just again, just something to be aware of that something to kind of keep in the back of your mind that trademark is specific. It's also expensive. Um, and that's how we all have to 
play the game of uh, protecting your ideas. Okay, well, listen, that's it. I know that was a, a lot. I, I wanted to give you guys time to give me questions, but you know, um, go out there and cook your own IP and eat it yourself, as I say. You know, remember, really decide if animation is the best for us expression. Really consider if it's relevant today. If you're going to get into cartoons, going to get animation, know the format. I didn't even talk about film. We can talk about that. Um, you know, consider the the independent approach and the bend the knee approach because they both have a lot of value. Understand that creating an animated series is creating an IP. And if you're creating an IP, there's a whole business around it. And that's how you earn wealth. And then remember that underneath that, um, every idea has a lifespan and every product is trademarked. And that's how the business of cartoon works. I will end my so slide. The show independent now. approach and the bend the knee approach, because they both have a lot of value. Understand that creating an animated series is creating an IP. And if you're creating an IP, there's a whole business around it. And that's how you earn it. And then remember. Sorry about that. Um, we have a little bit of a delay on no our, our side, about a 30 minute delay in between the different screens and everything. Um, so we're just gonna. This should be uh, live though, right? Yes, this is live. It's just there's there's just a little bit of a delay. Um, so, uh, yes, we are now opening it up. Sorry about that. Um, I hope that was helpful for you guys. Yes, we are now opening All right, uh, here we go. Uh, we have our. Oh, wait. No. Okay. Oh, there's two of them. For okay. Your uh, patience. Right. Uh, we have our uh, question person. Okay. I hope that was helpful for you guys. Yeah. Uh, thank you for. Uh, oh, geez, what's happening? Uh, just turn that oh that way. All right, this way. Here we go. Yeah, uh, just turn it back how it was. It was fine. Oh, there's oh, a there's lag. Yeah, yeah. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead and ask your question. Um, hi. So, um, what is the difference between the trademark and the copyright? I couldn't quite get that. So, trademark is an idea you have to file as a specific idea. What is what's the lines between a trademark and a copyright? Sure, I'm, I'm, there's a lot of noise going on, so I'm struggling a little bit to hear. Uh, okay, uh, here's how we'll handle it. I'll have them uh, uh, answer the question to me, and I will give the question. Yeah. The question was, how do uh, you manage um, the, what is the big? The difference between the trademark and a copyright, and what are the rules specifically on trademarks? Um, like, you said something about it expiring. Uh, so what are the, the biggest differences that you've noticed when sure. working with uh, trademark and copyright? Sure. And what are the okay. rules when uh, about ex it, it expiring and going into the public domain? Okay, so copyright is a protection on the fixed format idea, right? So uh, let's say you write a screenplay, that 120 page screenplay can be copyright, right? So that means the entire world everything you created within that is under the copyright, right? That lasts for the lifetime of the author plus 70 years. Now, trademark is product and country specific. So, you know, the example I made was if you have a universe like Star Wars, right? That overall universe is copyright when George Lucas wrote the first screenplay, right? Now, if someone wanted to make a X-Wing fighter toy, they would file trademark for that toy and they have about three years to make it. Otherwise they will lose the trademark, but that trademark is also country specific. Does that answer the question? Yes, that does answer the question. I will be pulling the next person up for a question. Yeah. Great. Uh, go ahead and ask your question. Thank you. I wanted to ask with animation and the uh, rise of Web3 and new technologies for animation, 
how should animators view Web3 and things such as NFT and blockchain as a part of their career or in building their story? Uh, did you get that? It is. Okay. You're, you're, you're good to go. Okay. So uh, it, it is complicated. Um, you know, the world of Web3 and blockchain and NFT, um, I think in terms of, you know, I, I try to advise people how to have a lifetime of success in storytelling and, and animation as a craft, right? Now, when it comes to NFTs and Web3 as a licensing aspect of your business, you know, as a way to bring out your idea to an audience, as a way, an extension to create character and stuff, absolutely study it, absolutely keep up to date with it. But, uh, you know, perhaps I'm an old school thinker, but I think none of that will make you a better storyteller. None of that will make you a better creator. It will make you a better artist. Um, it is a fantastic, incredibly powerful licensing expansion, you know, but I think your core skills are the things that will last for 50, 60, 70 years of your career. Um, and those things are the, the traditional things that I, I think uh, you should be focused on first. You know, I, I always look in my career for the people who I think are going to be the experts in that area, because I can't, I can't keep up and be an expert in all of them myself. So, you know, for our company, we have uh, an IT specialist who is constantly looking at all our IPs, all our development properties, all our stories and saying, this is a really good taste for a Web3 execution. This is a good time to do an NFT. This is a good time to consider blockchain as a you know financing structure. I pay attention to that, but I have to focus on making people excited about stories and characters. Excellent. Uh, our next question is here. Um, with um. The uh, past, we were really focused on um, trademarks in terms of the major profit generator with uh, products and kind of physical stuff coming out. But with the um, kind of era of mobile gaming becoming a new revenue generator, is copyright or trademark more important with game publishing in regards to control of the IP? The past, we were really focused. Okay, so the question became whether or not the discussion of copyright and trademark is important for a game-centric generation, um, and should they think differently in terms of how they deal with copyright and trademark? Um, I will say no. You know, I think gaming is, um, again, uh, for example, gaming is a great way to actually begin many IPs, uh, and then gaming is a great licensing expansion of an IP, so it goes both directions. Um, I think in terms of copyright and trademark, the rules are the same. So the copyright on World of Warcraft um, happened when the original GDD or game design document was created. Now it's a fixed format. Now it's copyrightable. Um, but, you know, World of Warcraft, they don't make a ton of money on the merchandising side. Actually, they do much more of their money on in-game kind of um, purchases. Um, so they need to trademark a different set of things that they're going to exploit rather than they don't worry too much about about plush and t-shirt and 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 toys for kids under six uh, but they do have to trademark areas that they're going to exploit and uh, they do have to make sure that those are country specific as well so i think the theory still holds um i would say just look at your intellectual property and kind of find the mix of what makes it money and then when you decide you want to go in those areas that's when trademark happens and every intellectual property has a different suite of stuff. I hope that answers the question. All right, our next question is here. Hi, if you wanted to pursue a partnership with an existing IP to make an adaptation, like creating a animated series or a game, how would you uh, start that conversation to pursue that partnership? Sure. And every intellectual property has a different suite of stuff. I hope that answers the question. Thanks. Okay, the question is if you want to have a partnership with an existing IP to do an adaptation into an animated series. So it's a pretty straightforward process. Typically, uh, an IP owner will even themselves represent the rights or have an agent who represents their rights. Okay, once you get in contact with that person, you're not talking about owning the IP, you're talking about a license of a portion, usually animation and the uh, derivative works based on animation. So the typical process is what's called an option to a purchase or a shopping agreement. Uh, and the option to purchase works like this. Um, 
someone has a book, I want to make an animated series based on it. So I will have the option to make that series, which will give me, let's say, two years to develop the story, the characters, and the financing to make it. Within that two-year two, two year period, I have to trigger the option to purchase, and then I'm going to pay them a large amount of money in order to make that animated series, right? So that's the option to purchase. And once I've purchased those rights, I'll sit on them from anywhere from like three to seven years, depending on the contract. And then um, I have the exclusive rights to make the animation based on that core intellectual property. The royalties will be set, the negotiation will be set, all the payment structure will work out. Pretty straightforward negotiating process, but it is a very heated conversation depending on how popular or unpopular the work is. Now, the other way to do it is called the shopping agreement. The shopping agreement is really that you have kind of uh, a, an understanding with the rights holder that I'm the exclusive period exclusive person who's going to be bringing back opportunities to the rights holder and you. And then you both have to agree in order to trigger. So in other words, you're going to let me shop around your idea. But during that time period, no one is allowed to shop it like me. There's no discussion on rights. There's no discussion on payments. All we're doing is letting me be the only person to talk in the marketplace so as not to cause confusion. Now, shopping agreement is weaker, uh, but it's also cheaper. And especially if you haven't done it before or you're in a lesser position, you can sometimes convince a major IP holder to do a shopping agreement because those can tend to last like three months or four months. If you feel like I'm just a few phone calls or I'm going to turn this over, then I would do a shopping agreement. So, Great. That was a really good answer. Um, here we go. Our next question. Hi, um, I was wondering about, you talked about format matters, about like police, hospital, legal, and occupational family. So I was wondering, are there like overlaps between those categories? Like you see the Incredibles, it's like family and occupational. Is there like, would you really niche down or can those overlap? Mm -hmm. So the question now is on format, whether or not like police, occupational, legal, family, or flyer is the only one, or if there is some overlap, like for example, uh, the Incredibles is a family occupational. Um, I tend to be strict. I tend to think that in the early decade of your career, like the first decade, get extremely good at one format. And I think the maestros can mix and match. You know, so when you're Brad Bird and you're doing a feature, you can shock everyone by being a master of family storytelling and marry it on top of occupational, right? Um, you can get there. I think there is some mix and match, but again, if you don't master one first and you won very, very well, um, as soon as you start to mix, usually the results are not super positive. Um, but I would say in terms of like the academic answer is there's usually a, a leading format and then a supporting format. And that's kind of going to be all, I mean, you can't do an occupational without having a found family, you know, so, and you can't do a family show without having four occupations that each of the family members have that support it. But what's the lead structure? And the lead structure is really the academic term that determines uh, what's called your story engine. You know, the story engine is a thing that makes this thing go all the time, right? Um, Incredibles is a film, so it's hard to compare, but Family Guy can go for, you know, a million seasons because the engine is always there. You're always walking on the family, right? But imagine if you gave uh, Peter in Family Guy a serial episodic adventure that he had to go through in order to be funny, you see it would kind of crowd the structure and take up real estate and, and no longer be a family show. Then it would be a flyer. I really liked the comparisons between the different um, uh, types of stories there for the shows. Our next question is from Shannon Fleming. Um, so I have a question. Um, you mentioned that it's a good idea to have a main character and seven to 10 supporting characters, but what if you want to make a show where it's about the dynamic between two main characters or like an ensemble? Great question. Great question. Okay, that question actually uh, makes me correct myself because I was incorrect in my presentation. I actually said that the traditional format needs a main character with seven to 10 supporting, but then I also contradictorily earlier said that collective journey is the more current format. So I think the question now became, what if you have a story that's really not about one person, but it's about a pair or a group or an ensemble? Um, that's a better idea. <laughs> so let me just say that. And what they would call that in uh, screenplay format is a two-hander or a three-hander uh, or an ensemble cast, 
right? Now, if you're gonna do a two-hander or a three-hander, uh, for the television format, what's really important is that your format is extremely simple. You know, so if you want us to understand and learn the complexities of two to three characters as they bounce off each other, it's hard to do that on top of a flyer, unless you're a really great, great, incredible writer that in six pages can get us to know five characters. That's hard, right? But imagine you're doing a three-hander and you're doing a family show. And in that family show, you're talking about three moms and what it's like for them to be three different types of moms. That sits comfortably on the structure. And then it offers us a point of view that this show, let's call it moms, is not about one mom, it's about momhood. And now we're in the collective journey. And now we're kind of probably more into the area that is, is current television. So great question, made me correct myself. I appreciate that. Three moms and what it's like for them to be three different types of moms. Hi, I just like to ask, since you talked about, you know, trends with current things, what do you see as current trends in regards to styles and like genres and what do you think might be in the future in that regard? So the question uh, is about style and trends. Uh, I think it's specifically probably in terms of a uh, look and, and feel. Um, I have always told people for my entire career is, is never chase trends. Like you have to do what you are uniquely qualified to create. And if what that qualification is happens to be in trend, lucky you. But if you chase, I always find out you're going to be a little bit behind, right? I think you can actually go with what you love. And if that happens to be trendy, then you're, you're in a really good spot. Um, uh, the big thing that I see uh, and have seen for the past, you know, probably 10, 12 years, you know, I was the, the, the producer and development executive on a show called Afro Samurai. It was one of the original kind of like Western producers going to Japan, trying to do anime. Um, I was really alone at the time. There weren't many people around doing the same thing. But, you know, since then, there's so much collaboration between Japanese studios and U.S. studios. There's such a deep penetration of Japanese style and animes, many, many types of tropes with American creators that I think they're kind of fully inseparable. So I, I kind of think anime is more like hip hop than, than style. It's like basically in everything already. And if it's not, it kind of feels like it's out there on its own or it's specifically trying not to be its own. Um, I will say that the, the two types of Japanese influence cartoons I, I like to talk about are uh, what I call um, cowboy anime, so cowboy anime is any Japanese anime influenced work where the creative center is not Japan. I think that's going to be trendy for a while. And then I call it the Tokyo Tune. The Tokyo Tune is when a Japanese studio tries to take on a Western IP and the Western IP holders think, oh, if we do an anime, uh, won't we get the worldwide audience? Um, I, it's just personal for me. I never really liked them. You know, I never really like whenever an anime studio does Blade Runner or an anime studio does, you know, um, uh, what's another, another big one. I, I uh, Avengers or X-Men. If you ever seen the animes for them, they're just like, I don't know, they don't work for me. Um, but I do see more of a trend happening because the businesses are trying to capitalize on that look and style. Uh, but those licensees, the people who want to license those major IP I don't think they get them in the way that American studios like deeply get them. So you always get this odd um, lost in translation feel. So um, yeah. All right, we have time for two more questions okay. and uh, I'm gonna go ahead and lead with my uh, question. Why are the trends in the, um, in the industry that you are most excited about that is happening right now that you're seeing? Okay, got it. So the trend I'm most personally interested in right now is actually the marriage of location-based entertainment with um, traditional animation, with kind of lifestyle and cartoons. So, you know, right now uh, people are coming out of pandemic. People are starting to finally mix and match again. We all want real experiences. And the apex of immersive entertainment is theme park. And there's all these great things that you can do in animation, in theme parks that I just never knew could ever be done. I mean, I've only been in the theme park business for two years and I'll give you all the spoiler for my new surviving animation episode, which is called um, Animation for Location-Based Entertainment. 
there are three things that I've discovered that you can do uh, in parks with cartoons that you can't do uh, in, in traditional animation. Number one, uh, the main character in a location-based piece of entertainment animation is always the customer. So the customer has agency, they're given a role and on something like a dark ride or an interactive uh, ride, you know, you're know, you the main character in the show. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that um, architecture and storytelling have to perfectly match. And to me, that's so exciting, so brand new. The fact that you're telling a story with fictional characters and with with media on top of like physical sets and, and set dressing and you know, kind of visual gimmicks and Pepper's ghosts and all these cool visuals. Your architecture mode of storytelling to me is so exciting. And then the third thing, if you're doing any kind of media, any kind of like screens that are like customer that uh, customers see, it's all what um, we refer to in traditional film as a oneer. So oneer is, is an idea that was made by Spielberg. It's the idea of like a, a no cuts thing. So maybe like 16 minutes, you'll have a shot with no cuts, like in the movie Jaws or something. Um, or not Jaws. Uh, yeah, Jaws has a fantastic winner. So every theme park rides a winner. And to me, that's a brand new type of storytelling. It's a brand new type of screenwriting. And it's a brand new way to uh, get people excited about characters and stories. All righty. Our last screen. question comes so from our uh, director, Ginger. Ginger. Hey, I saw hey. that you're also involved with, you know, the Filipino animation mm, yeah, industry awesome. as well, too. Mm. And I think so that's something that's interesting for the people here in the US. So uh, why was that something that, you know, you were, you got involved with what's important to you or like the idea of the cross culture of animation? Because you're one of the people who was actually involved in anime and animation, as right. opposed to some people that are not involved in both. Right. Uh, so, you know, the question came to me of uh, my involvement with um, uh, the Filipino animation community. Uh, there's an organization called CPAC, CCAP, which I've become an advisor to. So, you know, I'm uh, I'm a Filipino American, you know, um, and I'm in the in the 90s. I was one of the fewer minorities out there. I don't I didn't see a lot of Filipino executives. I didn't see a lot of um, Filipino directors and creators. Uh, um, I saw a few, but not as many as I wanted. So I've always wanted to support um, you know my particular culture and, and have the stories that we uh, are tell be important so you know I just wanted to um, you know help my own people in a way so I guess there's nothing more than that other than just me kind of uh, passionately wanting to help the people uh, that that gave me the the rules of life that I live by I mean I have a, a Captain America tattoo because I'm American but it's all based on traditional Filipino culture and storytelling on the inside. So I like to think that this is the, the lifestyle I defend, but this is also who I am. So together that makes me the weirdo that I am. Well, we're very happy to have you with us here today. And I uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I You're hope welcome. you all Thanks, really Adam. enjoyed it. Uh, I certainly learned a lot. And, uh, <laughs> We all hope that you enjoy the rest of the CFAC and thank you all very much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, everyone. Uh, I want to say goodbye uh, because uh, as the last draw for the last. We all hope that you enjoy the rest of the CFAC and thank you all very much for joining us today. Bye. 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 Bye.